Добрый вечер. Good evening. My name is Valentin Diakonov. I'm a curator of uh, the Fabric of Felicity exhibition, which uh, we are having just for the very last days on the third floor of Garage Museum. And today we have a very exciting moment. It's a fantastic uh, time because most of the participants of uh, the Fabric of Felicity uh, exhibition is the, the dream that came true, the dream of three curators that worked on this uh, exhibition. And it's great to have this dream come into reality. And um, we have a collaboration of legendary uh, Swedish artist Marie Louise Ekman, and uh, she uh, helped us a lot. And uh, she also worked uh, together with Maria Alint, a very nice curator, so they de uh, she designed a special uh, short with exclusive regional uh, design and drawings. Uh, and you are going to see uh, these images in uh, um, at the start of the lecture, and uh, uh, they s uh, sold uh, very fast. I hoped uh, at least to have at least one, but unfortunately we've sold them all, and so we don't have a single uh, uh, short left, uh, but that's not important. The most important thing is that uh, uh, we are having Maria Lind, who is a curator and uh, the uh, director of um, um, Kunsthalle, and uh, she's going to have a talk with uh, uh, Marie Louise Ekman, who is uh, an artist and the first uh, uh, female uh, professor of the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm. She is a film director. Director. She took part uh, in uh, Chekhov uh, Theatre Festival here in Moscow. She is a um, fantastic artist, uh, has a fantastic irony and humor, but also very serious when she gives this right, both to herself and to others, the right uh, for an important uh, feminist statement, uh, which is full of humor. And let's welcome uh, Maria Lind and Marie Louise Ekman. Just one uh, more thing. To make our event uh, more universal and uh, more illustrated, I can uh, hand uh, over this uh, uh, catalog of the uh, most recent exhibition uh, that uh, um, happens in Stockholm by Marie Louise so, Ekman. At thank you all for coming. Uh, and uh, thank you, Valentin and Garage, for inviting us here. For myself and for many other people in Sweden, Marie-Louise Ekman is uh, a major voice in the art life of Sweden. I would even say that uh, your work, Marie-Louise, is uh, one of the most important bodies of work uh, in the post-war period. Uh, for a long time, it was a pretty well-kept secret in Sweden. Your work was not seen that much abroad, uh, but it's increasing and I think it will continue to grow. And us being here is just one example of the relevance of your work beyond uh, the borders of Sweden. So we thought it would be interesting to talk both about your work here for Garage, the shirt that Valentin mentioned, and about some of your key works over the years, both within uh, visual arts, film, and theater. So, and afterwards, uh, you will have a chance to ask questions or share your thoughts and comments. So, we have uh, an image here of uh, the uh, sketch for the shirt because interestingly enough and not surprising, uh, the shirt has sold out completely, but it's relevant, I think, to, to uh, look at what you actually did and perhaps a little bit why you did it. Okay, but we start showing the pictures. Yeah, uh, I didn't see anything here, but I can move. Yeah? Oh, let's go back to the shirt, please. Yeah, this is my first drawing. Uh, I made something wrong, so I just made it with the tape and put another 
drawing on it. I think I like it very much when it's this yellow and white mix. Uh, this is uh, uh, something I've done a lot. This is my major uh, uh, items that I have been uh, painting during years time a lot. It's a ghost, it's flowers, it's where, uh, han fat, vad heter det? A sink. A sink, ja. Yeah. A thought, cigarette, uh, the, uh, a flashlight, the, the or... flashlight, uh, kiss, uh, uh, sausage, sausage, uh, very carpet, important uh, chair, piece of iconography. Yeah, you can, you see, I, I, the titles are, as you can see, and uh, street, uh, pencil, uh, and parket, uh, parcel. Rabbit, uh, and uh, uh, it's a way of doing uh, 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 something when you when you start learning uh, another language or learning how to read and write. Uh, uh, this is similar to what my imagination is, anyhow, uh, how to learn a new language, and I like to have, it's like stamps, uh, and I like to do this for Garage. Uh, it's like uh, learning a new language, and the and Garage made also this in Russian, uh, which I think was the best version of it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, so it's like, what uh, heter det? It's like uh, starting learning a new language, learning how to speak, how to understand. And on the reverse, on the back side, uh, yeah. there is something else. Yeah, and I don't think I had a picture of it. Uh, and it, the, the back side of the shirt is, I saw a photo of Melania Trump, uh, the wife of Donald Trump. And I think it was when she had a meeting at the... Uh, Mexican border, was it uh, this last summer? And she had uh, something written on her back then. It said, I don't care, do you? And uh, that was some kind of mad jacket to use uh, 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 at that moment. Uh, and so I made the back of this uh, uh, shirt with the text, I I care about you and you and you and you and you and then it was a lot of of persons uh, uh, in those uh, uh, squares in the back. Uh, th that is everyone that you care about in meeting in a street or at an office or wherever. And. Uh the way you have worked here with, with a, a piece of clothing, it's not the first time, actually. Um, the way you have worked over the years often involves uh, accessories or uh, things that you can wear, etc. cetera. Um, and in this case, I remember you were very adamant about the fact that it should be quite a big shirt. Yeah, it's a skill yeah. model. Uh, uh of man's shirt, mm. uh, a big shirt, yes. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, um, I think that I have, if I look upon what I've done during years time, I think that it is like different symbols. I've done the same kind of model of chair, table, flower, monkey, man, woman. The woman is always uh, with a, as a model from the start, my mother. Uh, and uh, and it is uh, this baby is from the start, my daughter, who is now 44 years old. Uh, 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 so I, I found a, a way of using those things in reality and then put them together as a language to tell stories. I mean, I'm a storyteller. Very much so. But I have to say, it took a while for you to speak in public like this about the fact that this is actually my mother originally in terms of the symbol, or this is my daughter. That remained quite a lot in, in the background. Um, 
And I thought that was interesting that you didn't foreground the biographical aspects, uh, but rather what the meaning created through the images would be with, and the knowledge about the specific was not essential in a way to, to reading the images. I, I think we met in the mid nineties and I, uh, I'm a late bloomer. So I think that uh, I wasn't aware of those things. Uh, uh, because if you are an artist, uh, uh, people around you, people uh, writing about you or analyzing you, they often want, want to know what is reality and what is fantasy. And has, do you paint your husband? Do you paint your children? What does your mother say? What does your father say? I've done films also about my alcoholic father and and uh, and uh, uh, you get a lot of questions that are, uh, are very uh, private and the re they relate to you as what have you gone through and what is true and what is uh, uh, fantasy and I think that I was interested in uh, describing what I've been through uh, on other levels. I didn't want it to be on a private level. I wanted it to be as something uh, happening uh, that I uh, I know something about, but it's not uh, uh, private. In so a way, I didn't know, I didn't uh, have that context myself, but now uh, the years ha have gone by and I, 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 I can see that it's like diaries when I look back. I can see, well, that was when I was pregnant and that was when I got children and that was when I divorced and that is, uh, blah, blah, yeah. So let's go to the PowerPoint with the images and... Uh, it's actually chronologically organized. Um, and uh, this is uh, a classic piece, uh, fish balls or fish cakes in lobster sauce. It's uh, an applique, so it's made of uh, silk. Um, and uh, it was exhibited in 1968 in a gallery. And it was almost immediately show, uh, purchased by the Modern Museum in Stockholm, which is the big national museum of modern and contemporary art. You were 24 years old at the time. And in real life- So now you know how old I am today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And as you can see, if you can spot it, it's quite big. It's 121 by 174 centimeters, which is rather big to be an applique. Can you tell us a little bit about how this uh, came about? This was, a small picture like this on a can uh, that, that you could buy with these uh, uh, fish balls in lobster sauce. And uh, it, was, uh, 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 it was in color and I liked this so much. So I thought I, I want to do this myself also, but I did it in silk and much, much bigger. And uh, that's what I did. Those are the 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 uh, shrimps, and those are the fish balls. <laughs> yeah, and it, uh, I can't uh, tell you anymore. I I made it because it was so funny to do. Yeah. And this is certainly the time when somebody like Klaus uh, Oldenburg would make his large soft sculptures, uh, stuffed in a similar way, and certainly this had a different. Uh, tone to it in terms of materiality, but also in terms of, of the motif, the subject matter. This dish, this uh, meal, uh, fish balls, uh, was a fairly new invention in Sweden in the post-war period. It's connected to industrialization and having canned food and having processed food, uh, but it, it's the kind of, of uh, uh, contemporary food at the time, which was quite low in terms of, of uh, the ladder of, of status of food. It was something more for, for, for um, let's say, the working class rather than something um, uh, fancy mm. food-wise. Mm. Uh, so I always thought it was uh, so interesting that you 
pick precisely this uh, for such a glossy, large artwork? I've done uh, uh, a lot of paintings with food and what, with what comes out of food also. Yeah. <laughs> the and, other way. Yeah. At the other end, so to speak. And here is also food around your neck and uh, on the tray in front of you. But here you are not appearing as uh, the artist, but as an actress. And uh, uh, to give a little bit of background, Öyvind Falström, who was an artist from Sweden, who moved to New York and who became quite central in the 60s and early 70s in terms of uh, pop art circles with a certain interest in, in politics and, and uh, geopolitics, let's say, and who came back to Sweden in the summers. Um, and he made uh, one film, and this is from this film, uh, called Provocation, uh, which is a bit of a strange translation of the original Swedish title because the Swedish uh, title starts with the first l words in the national anthem of uh, Sweden. Uh, and it's partly, the film is partly based on, on real events, like a street theater group protesting. Can you tell us a bit about what you were, what are you doing here? Well, this, this was something that was street theater and we went to a suburb and it was always secret filmings. Uh, the, we, we acted like a, a, a guerrilla group, so to speak, at that time. And, it, and I think it's 69, I don't remember quite, but uh, I think it, is, it was a demonstration against... Uh, uh, luxury food or something, and, and uh, I don't remember. Uh, it's a, a scene that you can, a part you can see in this movie, uh, and it was uh, uh, not uh, welcomed when it came, and it went down rather fast. I think this film it was too uh, too apart. Yeah, it was uh, considered so I, strange. So it's uh, very, very few people that have seen it. My students, when I was a professor, wanted to see it, and I felt very ashamed <laughs> when, uh, when, uh, when they wanted to see it. And we saw it together also. Uh, uh, I've forgotten almost everything about it. I can't uh, talk about it. But in, in yeah. the late, now we're in the late 60s. Yeah. Um, uh, you had... Uh, studied for a short period of time at a graphic design school, Beckmans. And what happened then? How did you actually start making art? I think that I started making art because I was so uh, in style of, the, uh, of uh, drawing uh, what was exact acceptable at, at that time. And I had my I had a bit uh, mannered, uh, yeah, a bit uh, I, I manneristic. Was, uh, and I wanted to uh, crush this manner uh, uh, and do something that I didn't know anything about. So I started to paint in oil, which is something that is very slowly uh, uh, and uh, and uh, I didn't uh, know what to do. And so I, I started to do something that, that I didn't know anything about. That's how I started. And you were mixing with people from the field of theater and uh, comics and... Uh... Yeah. I, I, I was a very close friend of Eivind. Eivind Falström was much older than, than uh, I was. We were at that time, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and he came with his wife from New York with uh, comic books and uh, uh, told us what was happening at the artist stage with Jasper Jones and Andy Warhol and uh, and Rauschenberg and everyone, and and so he was uh, our contact with a big world, so to speak, and it was fantastic every 
summer when he came to Stockholm and informed us about what was going on outside Sweden at that time. And here we're jumping forward a little bit uh, to the mid uh, 70s. And uh, here we can see how things uh, seem to often have started. You described that you saw the label on this can with the fish balls. Here on the upper left, there is uh, one uh, image from uh, a comic book, um, The Phantom, which then is worked on until it becomes uh, a big painting. Yeah, and uh, at that time, this little girl, she's 47 today, the mother of my grandchild sitting there. Uh, 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 and uh, yes, I've always uh, loved comic books, uh, the way that they uh, minimally, minima, minimalize uh, the the uh, the way of describing things, and and uh, and this is then uh, uh, from this uh, Phantom comic book, and uh, and I immediately liked it, and I wanted to do the same, but in my way, and this is my version of this, and then uh, there I think it is the Phantom and his girlfriend that are bound under this palm. And, uh, uh, and in my picture, it is my, at that time, I think she was three years, perhaps, uh, staying, crying under this tree and with all her uh, uh, tranquilizers, yeah, the little thing and her that you toys. Saw. And uh, the lions that are around, uh, aggressive to this couple, love couple, uh, in the comic book. Here they are, uh, uh, this, those are aggressive, but they also have these uh, uh, other things that are aggressive and uh, uh, behind them. So, uh, yeah, that's my version of the same situation. <laughs> and uh, this one is also painted on silk. Um, can you speak a little bit about your use of, of uh, fabric? Yeah, at that, uh, this time I, I painted on silk, yes. Uh, I don't do that anymore, uh, uh, but I did it. Uh, I found my material. Uh, uh, it was, uh, yeah, it's important, uh, uh, the technique that you, uh, have uh, when you shall uh, work. Uh, and for me, uh, the way uh, uh, that uh, the colors uh, acted and the, and the pressure with the pencil and, and uh, yeah, uh, it was easy for me to not uh, think of the technical part of the, uh, of the painting, but uh, the story I wanted to tell, and uh, and it worked very good for me with um, painting with gouache color on silk. And uh, it's not irrelevant that in terms of the history of uh, women artists contains uh, so many examples of women painting on fabric, which for a long time was considered a, a female technique and therefore was uh, looked down upon, let's say, and this is something that recurs in your work that you often pick up on materials that are not prestigious in, in um, a modernist art uh, context, let's say. And I think that also you can, I think also that that is uh, a question of that I'm not uh, academic uh, educated. Uh, you didn't go to a So I art had to... Uh, uh, know myself and uh, uh, what is bad and good for me. And I didn't have any teachers or any surrounding that told me what is prestigious and not what is not prestigious and what have artists done uh, a lot of years before me uh, and so forth. Uh, so uh, as I started to work with my sewing machine with silk, uh, I had this material in my studio and it was 
some kind of just uh, slight movement to start painting on this material also. This is also a really good example of how the child enters the picture around the time when you have your own children. And this perspective, uh, the experience of the child or the worldview of the child uh, with a lot of empathy. Uh, in this case, the, the child is, uh, is uh, sad, um, seems as if she's crying with her hands uh, in front of her eyes. What about this uh, perspective of the child? Yeah, I think that uh, uh, the surrounding for a grown-up person is uh, rather hard. And uh, perhaps it's more hard for a child because when you are a child, you don't almost decide anything yourself. You have uh, school or you have... Uh, father and mother and you have uh, uh, friends and you have uh, you are uh, in the hands of the surrounding and uh, so it's uh, very hard being a child I think uh, uh, yeah lucky if you have good father and mother and school uh, and if not you just have to wait for being a grown a person to have you make your own decisions. The world of the child also enters the world of your art through toys. And uh, the settings that you have made with toys uh, are varied. Uh, this is one particular series that you worked on for a while with sardine cans. Mm -hmm. Would you like to tell us something about this? I've always loved the toys. Uh, I still do. I still buy toys. Uh, uh, toys are uh, are a, 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 a fantastic invention. It's all. It's very often miniatures of grown-up uh, life. Uh, it's miniatures of. Uh, of uh, what you handle as a grown-up person. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, this is a way of uh, mixing grown-up uh, life with, uh, uh, with uh, via those toys, yeah. And the settings that... And, it, uh, and it's different, you, you can say it's different rooms. And it's always on this pink... Uh, uh, teddy, you, teddy. Do you say teddy? No. Teddy uh, fabric, uh, like with a. It's a bit like fur, fake fur, uh, pink fake fur. I don't remember the the word for it, but it's always this is the space anyhow. And uh, a characteristic here is that the setups uh, are a bit surrealistic. There is a, a level of absurdity involved in the encounters and the scenes that are staged. I didn't think so when I made them. Uh, <laughs> thought they were absolutely realistic, naturalistic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in this work, it's uh, a remade doll's house, you could say. Yeah. Different kind of rooms. Uh, the persons that bought it uh, at that time, it's made 74. Uh, they put it in their bathroom, so it is destroyed. It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, uh, but it's different rooms. I've all I've been working a lot with rooms and houses and what happens in different parts of the house, and that you can have a certain meeting and a, lo a certain uh, relationship and and uh, things happening in one room and. Be, uh, Behind the wall, something just the opposite is happening. And uh, so this is uh, a different kind of rooms uh, where different things happen. And as you said at the beginning, when we talked about the shirt, uh, there 
images that become like icons, symbols that return. We can see the sink, we can see the blonde lady, uh, we can uh, see uh, the, the lamp. And it's very consistent even on the level of uh, the pattern of the wallpaper. So the exact same pattern exists in other paintings and other works as well. So you, as you described it, it's a language where one can recognize the vocabulary uh, really early on. Yeah. yeah. What do you would you like to say something about you, this? You one? put questions. This is made seventy one. You know, I have to uh, remember. Uh, uh, yeah, this is waiting room, and it's uh, it's a big woman with a small head and a big body, and the opposite for the man, uh, a small body and a, a big head, and uh, it's a lot of my personalities that I have been painting, waiting in this room, and uh, uh, yeah, it's a waiting room with different kind of personalities. Yeah, and uh, and uh, and uh, excuse me, the swimming suit, the the clothes for the, the woman is the eternity, the the uh, yeah, the dream. Yeah, uh, so the palm trees, uh, the seascape, um, the longing for a different uh, situation, the longing for a different world, but incorporated. <coughs> sorry in uh, her bathing suit, sorry. <coughs> I think it's a, a beautiful example of how the different worlds can exist inside uh, one painting. And then there is yet another world, let's say, through the painting in the painting. Mm -hmm. mm. And some of the, the figures and, and uh, particularly the trees, they, they look a bit like uh, their, um, a set for a theater play or something. Mm. And the whole situation is like a stage, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the metaphor of the stage and the image of the theater is uh, important. And- uh, You can go back. Yeah, and if you, yeah. And the guide here into the waiting room uh, or the stage, uh, he has a, a, a catalog that says facts, and the the women coming here is the the foreground colors. Uh, so uh, it's a little bit of thinking behind this, also. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it comes a, a, a bird with a. I don't know if you have the same uh, language here, but we talk about in Swedish anyhow the red thread. Do you have the uh, when the it's saying the the uh, it's continuing? Yeah, to continue. to uh, when describe you continue continuity. something. Uh, so the bird is bringing the red thread. Yeah, yeah. And perhaps the most well-known painting by you from uh, 1973 called Striptease. Here we're back to the structure of uh, the comic to some degree with one little image box uh, for each stage. Yeah, it's a striptease and uh, the, the, uh, the classical way of thinking of striptease is a woman that takes off her clothes and then she's naked at the end. She shows everything and she disappears. And here the woman is taking off her clothes and then is taking off her body. And inside her body, it's a monkey. And inside the monkey, it is a man. And inside the man, it is a bird. And the bird flies up in the sky. Mm. So uh, don't be sure that it's just one person that you look at when you see striptease. <laughs> <laughs> and the blonde lady with whom it starts here, it would be interesting to hear you speak a little bit more about her. 
yeah, and uh, what I understood, I didn't understand that from the beginning, but it's my mother, she is the model and uh, for the blonde lady, she was bl a blonde lady, and uh, and uh, uh, I've understood that uh, this is my mother. She, ne she never made any striptease, but she is the model for the woman that uh, is going through a lot of things. Uh, uh, she does a lot of things, and things are happening to her. But she always looks uh, quite proper. Yeah. She's neatly dressed. Yeah. Um, she often has her handbag. Yeah. Um, but then things turn out to be partly dramatic. Um, of course, you're a visual artist, but you're also a filmmaker uh, with um, around 10 feature films um, and three television series made for Swedish state television in the late 80s and early 90s. And uh, the first film um, where you wrote the script and where you also acted as the lead character because it's an autobiographical story is Hello Baby. And this is one of the uh, key scenes in Hello Baby. Uh, it was directed by Johan Bergenstrohle, uh, who at the time was your husband. Uh, can you tell us a bit about how, how you came to work with film and what this particular film actually meant for you then? I, I don't remember, but I think I had made some short movies before this. And I was, uh, as you mentioned, married to a man who was a director at theater and he also made films and uh, and he was uh, 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 trying to write a new script together with a producer at that time and and uh, and they met different authors and they tried to do scripts and it they uh, they didn't come out with anything that the, they were satisfied with. And uh, I saw the meetings on distance and I heard the, 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 him talk about it. Uh, and then I, I, I thought, I will do a script that I, on a movie that I want to see. And I didn't tell him or the producer, so I just uh, wrote a script. And when it was finished, I gave it to my husband who read it and was very satisfied and gave it to the producer. And, uh, and it was about a girl uh, from, the, from the age of eight until uh, and goes through what, what she's going through, her childhood, the quarrels in the, in the home with the alcoholic father and the, and the mother, the fights between them, and then her, uh, her teenage period, uh, and, uh, and then she f um, meet a man who <laughs> should be then this husband, and, uh, and, when she, and the film ends up with when she gives birth to her child, the mother of Elsa, uh, and uh, so it was uh, a storytelling uh, a, a girl from being a girl till bringing a new girl to to life, and uh, and I got very shocked when my husband and the producer wanted me to to play the leading part. I didn't have that in mind because I thought it was very funny to write the script and give to them to do what they wanted with, but they wanted me to play the part. And, and then I had to rewrite a lot of scenes, parts of it, because I was a bad actress and, and I didn't want to have uh, to speak too much and, and to act too much. So I wanted to just, so my, you can say that the part of the girl in this movie is she uh, she looks very much upon what's happening around uh, so it's uh, a description of 
time and what's happening around. Yeah, and also I think it's uh, really interesting in terms of the the growing into maturity of a young woman from the girl to a young woman, mm -hmm. the shaping of a character, the the understanding somehow of the world uh, around her. Mm -hmm. There's some quite dramatic events. What about this scene? What is going on here? Why are you dressed like this? Normal painting clothes, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Felt normal. Yeah. How was the film received? Very well, I remember. Uh, uh, very well. And uh, I think we have another still here from a later film um, called Mommy, Daddy, Kids from uh, 1977, which uh, is a bit different. Yeah, this is me doing a film. The other one was my husband doing a film. I had written the script and I played the leading part, but it, it was him doing the film. It's a big difference. Uh, uh, this is me writing the script and, uh, and directing. And what is the story in the film? Oh my God, shall I remember this? It's, uh, it's about, the, the leading part is this little girl. It's about a girl. Uh, uh, and her uh, her will contra the will of her mother and father. And here, the mother has what uh, is uh, uh, it? Hämta uh, catch her. What uh, is Oh, she picked her up from, uh, from the nursery school. Yeah, and uh, uh, she wants to do something else. And the mother has uh, been shopping a lot of food and is want to go home uh, uh, fast to do the dinner and do work, uh, evening work that she, she, uh, she has to do. And it's a fight between mother and daughter. Another example of how the perspective of the child is central because the whole film is uh, seen through her eyes, let's say. Yeah. And the absurdity of the world of the grown-ups. She has very, very good connection, this girl, with her mother and father when they have gone to bed, the mother and father, father and they fall asleep, and then she can start playing with them, yeah. which she does. Yeah. She puts toys on their face. It's a beautiful yeah. scene. But the set design is uh, special here as well, with the sausage uh, on the left and the pens. Yeah, I think that, uh, that uh, if I don't remember wrong, the set, the set design was made by my first husband, uh, Carl Johan Dier, who uh, is a photographer and uh, a painter and, uh, and a scenographer. Uh, and uh, this was a cooperation with him. So the whole setup, as you can guess from seeing just one image, is rather theatrical again. So this metaphor of the theater and, and theatricality uh, is central. Mm -hmm. And this we can understand also here. Uh, it's a, a photograph from a, a ballet performance, Giselle, by the renowned Swedish choreographer Mats Ek. Um, where you did uh, the uh, set design. Did you also do the costumes here? Yes. We have been working together since uh, uh, the mid-70s. Right now we are working at the uh, uh, L'Opera Garnier, the national opera for ballet in Paris. We are doing Carmen and Bolero. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, it's very. Uh, it has been a fantastic uh, uh, period working together with this man, this choreographer and director, Matsik. Uh, because when you work, he uh, we he works with dancers, and and uh, if you work with dance, you have to have the whole space on stage. So it, I've always done backdrops, which I have painted. Uh, and it have, have suits me fine to do that. 
And this backdrop involves uh, body parts. Yeah. And uh, how did it become precisely that for this performance? I think that I, I had done a similar painting before with body parts in a, a, a room, uh, in a space uh, where, uh, an uh, exhibition space, and instead of putting uh, pictures on the walls, I put uh, uh, parts of, bo of bodies on the floor. And this is also uh, typical that you use something in one medium, in one genre, and then you pick it up somewhere else. So there is a, a sort of flowing of uh, shapes and, and images uh, that one can recognize across. Another uh, film still uh, from uh, the film The Secret Friend, which is one of my absolute favorite films all times. I saw it before we, long before we knew each other. And uh, it, when it was playing in the cinemas, I went to see it five times, uh, bringing as many friends as I could. Can you tell us a bit about this film? I first have to start with telling you that this was my husband. My third and last and big love. Oof. He died two years ago. Pop up. <laughs> um. The actors here, um, in addition, are Ange Tugoyargård in the middle and uh, Carl Bilkvist. And uh, they uh, appear here in rather special outfits with uh, ladies. Uh, underwear or uh, morning gowns and what we can recognize from from what you have said and what we've seen here is that it takes place inside an apartment and a little bit on a terrace outside and it's a drama between people of uh, is it four men and one woman um all happening within three, three men, three men, these and one woman yeah, and yeah. one woman yeah. uh, within these four walls. And uh, it's fantastically um, empathetic, but absurd at the same time. Yes, I, uh, I always, uh, I like men crying. <laughs> that, that's the true uh, Thing to uh, uh, to say, uh, I think that it suits them fine to do that. If you film or on stage, also, uh, 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 and to pick up the inner the inner person, inner person, and uh, and if you have a very masculine type uh, actor, uh, it's uh, very interesting to uh, to find his inner person, and it's. Uh, Rather often, a woman, and and uh, and I also like then to dress them as women uh, because I think things happening uh, then when you do that, uh, it, it's uh, yeah the the actors act in another way, and uh, at this time th those three men and the woman was uh, four fantastic actors. They're all. Sort and of today the, they are all gone. Yeah, but the it's four uh, of them. Uh, but they were, the woman who was in this also was the woman at the Royal Dramatic Theatre in Stockholm. And uh, he, I mean, th those were uh, fantastic actors. And yes. to see them act together when you do another agenda for them than they usually do or did at that time was very, very interesting. Yeah, it's creme de la creme uh, in terms of actors. Uh, yeah. Really amazing people. And you've also made a music video. Yeah. And the, the funny thing is that uh, uh, at this time I was a professor at the Royal Academy in Stockholm. So this four uh, persons, the lady with the bird, the lady in the, uh, uh, without, uh, uh, with only a half body, and those two, uh, it was my students, uh, and uh, 
the, and uh, Annika here uh, has been, she was in Hello Baby, I met her already there, she has been in a lot of my films. And uh, this was the, the, the singer, Josephine Nilsson, uh, that we made this uh, uh, movie about, High Hopes and Heartaches. Yeah. And it was done as a sideshow uh, uh, in the beginning of last century. It, that was very popular in, in, uh, in the States, that you, in, uh, in the circus world, you also had sideshows where you showed people that were different. And so I wanted to, to make a group like that, that was acting in this uh, movie. Yeah, so like uh, uh, bearded ladies or people with uh, um, unusual bodies, etc. And you have uh, said that your favorite film, or one of your favorite films, is Freaks yeah. by Todd Haynes, which precisely deals with a group of uh, performers from such a sideshow. Yeah, Todd Browning. Browning, sorry. Yeah, Todd yeah. Browning. Yeah, yeah. Made in the thirties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I always connect this to your interest in the, that which is um, subordinate, let's say that which is not privileged, uh, that which is considered abnormal or is uh, uh, lesser valued, let's say, for different reasons. Yeah, and it's very easy to to have the power if you think that you are normal and a person is not normal uh, beside you. And so those personalities in the sideshows were people living uh, very, very sad lives very often. You're not afraid of... Uh standing up in uh, the public sphere and uh, sharing your opinion, sometimes uh, quite critical of certain things. This is uh, a text that you wrote for one of the evening newspapers, Aftonbladet, in 1980, uh, called The Swedish People and uh, the Gentleman Art. Uh, and it's, uh, I would say, a kind of uh, attack on the male-dominated art world. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Can you tell us something about why you decided to actually write an article and publish it in this way? You could maybe have expressed this in other ways. I, I mean, I don't remember, but... but uh, 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 it uh, was a lo uh, when I was became a professor or or, or a rector at these schools. I was the first one. It was on, only men at that time. When was this this done? It's uh, nineteen eighty. Yeah. So it's uh, uh, it, it was a lot of men deciding and uh, choosing other men. And the quality that was discussed was with the uh, agenda of how uh, men had acted before, painted before, written things before. That was the right and wrong that uh, was uh, uh, discussed. And if you come and have another background, uh, another education, other uh, kind of fa fantasies, then you are looked upon as if you belong to a sideshow, you can see, uh, you can say. And, and uh, so uh, uh, I think it's, uh, it's important to, to uh, write and to paint and to do, uh, to say uh, your opinion. And uh, I find it important to mention that the art context where you were active in the 70s and 80s in the, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Spring is in the air. Believe it or not, it's uh, however many degrees minus, but there is some pollen in the air. Anyway, so uh, those days in Sweden, uh, the art scene was heavily 
uh, dominated by a particular modernist discourse on the one hand, very much about shapes and colors and form, um, explorations in, in, in uh, a Greenbergian manner. And on the other hand, a highly politicized art scene with uh, almost uh, propaganda-like uh, images. And you didn't quite fit into this. So what you're describing is also uh, an art scene in general where your work was not fitting into the dominating categories. No, 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 uh, the, uh, because I didn't come from the academy. Uh, and the uh, uh, funny thing was that later on I was chosen into this place, but not by the uh, male colleagues or the rector. They were against me, it, but from the students. Uh, so uh, I was chosen in both cases, uh, as a professor and as a rector, by the students. And uh, uh, that's, for me, very important. Mm. And um, you were then the first full female professor ever uh, in the history of the academy, uh, which was established uh, in the 18th century. And you started the first video department in a Nordic art school in the mid 80s. Yes, I thought that this art school was the best film school <laughs> because we discussed not technique, we discussed what was important to do and what uh, what is uh, your background and what is your story and uh, what do you want to uh, express and uh, we we talked about those analyses and not about how doing things technically in one way or another. The technique came as number two or three, but the uh, content uh, was uh, uh, the first, it was the premier thing to, to have on your agenda. While we still have this image up, we can notice that uh, in the shell on the podium, on the pedestal, uh, it's not Venus, uh, Venus Botic by Botticelli, it's a little girl. Yeah, my girl at the time. She was two or three years time, years at that time. And uh, I, I painted her a lot of times and drawn her a lot of times as uh, uh, the woman in the, uh, in the Botticelli painting. Uh, but I made it with uh, children instead and new persons new personalities in life. Um, a little bit more about your presence outside of the sphere of art. Uh, films, of course, circulate in cinemas. You made the television series, so accessible in, in more or less every household across the country. The article in uh, the newspaper. And these were like little poems, one could say, that you wrote really regularly for several years in the 80s for the same evening newspaper. So you have to imagine the most, um, the, the best-selling evening newspaper uh, carrying this type of material uh, very regularly. It's, uh, I think, quite unique that they collaborated for such a long time with an artist and gave you space to to um, express, and there are translations of this, I don't have an image of it, but they are often really poetic and often observations of uh, a person's uh, feelings in a particular situation, where as a reader, I have the impression that you're trying to enter somebody else's mind and understand how they feel in a particular situation. Yeah, and I made. I can say those evening papers don't do this anymore. No. Since many years, they don't act like that. Uh, but this was you have called me a serial, not killer, but painter, and and uh, uh, and this was serial also. So this was monologues, and I, then I had a series that perhaps of for seven uh, times with monologues for different kind of personalities. I had a ser I have had these uh, uh, themes, and I had, uh, for instance, I had one theme that was 
persons that I own. And uh, then I uh, named different persons, living persons, uh, persons that I never had met or seen on television or whatever, but I thought I owned them. And that then happened uh, a very funny thing. Uh, uh, persons came to me and were a little bit upset and, and asked me, why don't I own them? <laughs> uh, and uh, because they felt a little bit outside this, uh, why weren't they owned? And I thought that was rather funny because uh, if you talk about owning somebody, uh, it's double. Uh, but uh, that uh, also describes when uh, the hierarchy, when people think, I want to be owned, or no, I don't want to be owned, but I want to be owned by you, not by you. Uh, so it started uh, funny situations. We just have a few more images. Uh, this is uh, an early work from 1973, uh, which can seem pretty brutal, although it's made in a slightly naivistic style, almost looking like um, illustrations in a children's book. Yeah, and this is, uh, uh, I've, ma I've made a lot of paint paintings uh, of this little comic. Uh, I don't know her name in, in English, is it Lisa? In Swedish, it's Lisa. Uh, but I've made her a lot of times. Uh, she's living with her aunt, and her best friend is a working class boy who lives without any parents. And they try to figure out the the reality together. And she's she thinks that she is very clever, and he is very hands on. This. Uh, working class boy, Sluggo, his name is in Swedish. And uh, here she sits looking at television. Uh, this is the last slide I have. And it's actually a self portrait. Yeah. Can you tell us about? <laughs> uh, uh, I have also made, made, uh, made a lot of, uh, of those paintings with this opening. Uh, it's an opening in a wall, in, it's an opening in a body, it can be something that is brutal or not, but it's an opening anyhow, and uh, you look inside or you look outside, and yeah, yeah. I think it's, uh, yeah, a good picture <laughs> of a person yeah. looking at something. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, the nose, uh, sometimes it... Uh, cuts loose and uh, takes on a life of its own um, and appears by itself. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> you um, said in an interview more than 20 years ago that you thought being part of the board of the housing association in the building where you lived at the time was extremely interesting. Um, and this is um, a task to be a member of such a board that most people dread because they think it's totally boring. Why do you think it's so interesting to be part of a context like a board of a housing association? Because I, uh, I mean, uh, you choose a husband or you are very close to your children and you choose your friends and what to uh, take part in or not. But when you uh, are in situation where you, uh, situations where you haven't chosen your company, other things happen. And, uh, and uh, it's very interesting uh, to meet people that you haven't chosen yourself. Uh, I'm... I, I'm curious on what's going on in other people's mind. Yeah, and I think this is maybe just a good conclusion from our, from my side before we open up to say that your really incredible interest in other people and in people's minds uh, and your ability to translate 
that into the, all the different mediums and genres that we just caught a glimpse of in this uh, presentation is uh, not only unique, but also quite important. Uh, the ability to actually be open to and take uh, a genuine interest in other people. What's left more than that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it's very often so that uh, uh, I think when I was younger, uh, I was more naive than I am now. And, and uh, I, uh, uh, if I saw a person laughing very loudly, I thought that that was a very happy person. Uh, and uh, I have learned then and seen behind and can see that a person laughing very loudly can have a lot of problems that she or he tries to hide. Uh, uh, by acting. Uh, when you uh, work with theatre, for instance, you talk about undertext, what's under uh, the text, the words, and, uh, and you can have the same sentence and you can pronounce the words in different ways and you can say, I love you, and it can mean something, and you can say it in 10 different ways and it can mean the opposite also and and uh, and uh, it's like uh, uh, to decipher the 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 life and the uh, the the relationship uh, between people and it's very interesting to see the hidden language i think that if i shall describe uh, myself uh, what i have been working with and what I'm interested in, uh, that's the hidden language, the hidden meeting. If I, uh, if I should make a, a meeting, a, a, a painting uh, with two women sitting and talking to each other, like you and I now, uh, well, then you could take a photograph of us and you could see exactly the dress what, uh, for you and for me and our faces, but that won't describe us. Uh, I would, if I should make a, a painting of us, I would paint what I think you have in mind right now and what I have in mind. And, and, and that is also related to what happened perhaps earlier today for you and what happened for me last night. Or, uh, so uh, it's a very complex meeting that we just see the top of when you see two persons like this and you think interesting, not interesting, but the, it's a lot of layers behind. And I think th that's very, very, I'm very curious on, on finding out those things. <laughs> Great, so yeah. let's open up now. Do we have a microphone for the audience? Пожалуйста, руку, мы передадим вам микрофон. So, shall I have this one? Then? It's fine in English also, if you want. Uh, it's okay, it's okay. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Hi. Hi, my name is Anna. And my question related to one of your work, namely Waiting Room. May you please explain us why did you, sorry, deconstruct it only men's bodies? They're like deconstructed in some of the ways with like long necks, mainly or like completely. I don't understand the question why uh, why, why did you decide only to deconstruct the men's bodies but not the women's except of the big body woman here yeah, your here, question is everywhere. why he has a small body and she has a big body no 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 no, no. if you're going to have a look at the picture you will see that only men's bodies yeah. are deconstructed i mean changed yeah Thank you. Like with long necks or like uh -huh. they don't have... Never thought legs. of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good oh, question. Okay. <laughs> Good question. I, I think I just thought it was normal to do it that way. I don't know. Thank you. And luckily this painting is now in the collection of Moderna Museum at the Modern Museum in Stockholm. So... Hopefully, if you come to Stockholm uh, soon, they will put it up uh, on display. Thank you. 
Yeah, Here I am. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, thank you for this interesting lecture. And uh, uh, my question is about women in art and their role in uh, art context. Uh, do you think something changed uh, now since uh, 70s, 80s, 90s? Uh, what uh, happens with uh, women in art now? Uh, something changed on everything is stable as usual. I think it has happened a lot of things. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of things have, have happened. Uh, uh, the look upon uh, 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 women artists and male artists are uh, very changed. Uh, I, uh, I don't see the same uh, uh, arena today as I, I saw at that time. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's quite another landscape today, uh, but uh, I uh, but I still think that uh, in the background uh, uh, it's like a ghost that you uh, think that uh, the right way sometimes are uh, an old-fashioned patriarchal male way of doing things uh, as if it was the right way and it is more emotions and not have the same quality if it's not done the way you are used to through a lot of years uh, earlier. Uh, but I think uh, it's a very strong movement uh, that has uh, started many years ago and it's going on. Can I maybe add something yeah. to this? In in terms of uh, statistics, um, in a country like Sweden, actually since the early 20th century, there have been almost as many female as male students uh, uh, at art academies. But the big difference uh, f during the first part of the 20th century compared to the last uh, decades was that uh, most of these women artists did not uh, go on to have um, a professional trajectory. And on top of that, most of them were not written into history. So what they were making was often considered women's art and women's art did, was not taken as seriously and was not considered part of, of art history, let's say, which is what, one explanation to why they have been so invisible. Uh, an interesting um, uh, initiative at the, the Modern Museum in Stockholm, I keep referring to this because it is the central main museum in the country, is that um, after uh, the fact that one of its curators about 15 years ago started to be quite annoyed uh, about the purchases in the early um, 21st century still being very biased, meaning that many fewer women artists were bought by the museum than male artists. And she uh, did by herself a bit of statistics and presented it to the director of the museum. And he did not believe his eyes. He had never thought about this before. But of course, you cannot deny it when you see the figures. So then they started to be more considerate in relation to how many women and how many men were bought. Uh, but then an, the next uh, challenge came because if you s then calculated the amounts spent on the works by women artists compared to the works by the male artists. There was a huge difference in terms of uh, what they were prepared to pay for a work by a woman artist as uh, supposed to uh, one by a male artist. So one always has to problematize these things on, on so many different levels. And this is just one little facet uh, of that big discussion. But my impression now is if you look at, at contemporary art in the, 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 the art scenes that I'm familiar with, and this goes for different parts of the world, it's actually the women artists who are now actually making uh, perhaps the strongest work. There is a certain momentum. I totally agree.
Thank you so much for such interesting conversation. Um, I have a very short question. I've noticed a lot of pink color in many of your works, and I was very curious, like, is there any special reason? What is so special for you in the pink color? Yes. Uh, Look uh, at her today. Yeah. Uh, uh, for me, it's the color of flesh and the color of uh, the the skin color that we all have because if you have different surfaces that's one thing but if you cut a little bit you have all we have all the same color on our flesh and that's pink so for me it's meat and flesh and it's human i get uh, i feel very strong contact with this uh, color because of its flesh-like uh, impression. <laughs> Has nothing to do with princess or anything like that. <laughs> hey, thank you both for an interesting discussion. Uh, I wanted to ask, you had such a prolific career. Did you ever had creative blocks and how did you overcome them? If I ha uh, your question is if I have had problems uh, uh, like creating, uh, creating things or uh, yeah, like the pauses in the in your art. Uh, I'm not a neurotic person. Uh, my uh, husband said he had never met a person uh, so little neurotic as me, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, I, I agree. I I I don't think I'm neurotic and. Uh, I think that I have had uh, uh, periods when I felt uh, that I don't have anything to uh, uh, come up with for perhaps four hours or something like that. <laughs> uh, my crisis has have been uh, five hours at the most, perhaps six hours. Uh, 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 but I've also... Uh, uh, I've been doing... Uh, I've been writing, I've been painting. I, I, I don't do the same, all the things at the same day, but uh, I, as I've been working with students uh, for many years, uh, uh, when I was then a professor, I had uh, 30 students that were my own, that uh, at that time it was for five years that we followed each other. And, uh, uh, and then I also started at that time the film studio, the video studio. And then because of that, a lot of students from other departments came. So they became my students also. And, and uh, at that time then, uh, of course I couldn't paint then. I mean, all, all daytime were with my students. And when you came home, uh, I had my small children and, and, uh, and uh, I didn't have the energy, the power to then to do paintings. So then I sat instead in the nighttime writing scripts because that's another kind of energy. And then I, uh, when we had holidays, I made films in the nighttime when my children were with, uh, I divorced, that's a good thing to do because then you have uh, your own weekends or weeks uh, and, uh, and you can work uh, whenever you want. And uh, so I, then I made films and wrote those periods. So uh, I've been doing uh, periodically different kind of things. I didn't paint for, I think, 15 years or something like that uh, because I uh, was working at the academy and with other people. So you can, uh, I mean, last period I worked, uh, I won't do it anymore. Uh, I'm finished with this, uh, other things uh, outside my studio. But uh, the last period when I worked at uh, another place, it was at the Dramatic Theatre in Stockholm. And, uh, and, You were the director at the Royal Dramatic Theatre, yeah, and in uh, a way, for six years? Yeah. And uh, you, at the same time, were also uh, staging, you wrote a play, and you directed yeah, yeah. a play, and staged it, so yeah. there, 
And you also made uh, uh, videos with the, the actors that you posted online. So your output was directly related to the theater. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, yes, now I remember what I was going to tell you. Uh, I, uh, then I was in charge of this uh, very, very prestigious place. And for me, I was a, I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I have to do it the way that I act in my studio or the way you analyze as an artist, the way you behave. So for me, it was uh, uh, an artistic, uh, it was an artist work uh, to be in charge of the theater. Uh, and then you sit in a lot of meetings with a-, a Very, very interesting. With the government, with a, a culture department, with, a, uh, with different kind of uh, groups. Uh, uh, the unions. Yeah, uh, and it's very interesting to, to be, because if you come into a new group, I've been to a lot of opera houses in Europe because of the cooperation with Matsek. We have done a, a Swan Lake and Giselle and a lot of things together during uh, a lot of years. And every time you come to a new opera house and you sit together, uh, uh, the first meeting will, with all workshops and, uh, and uh, with the producers and uh, yeah, the people, Perhaps it's 20 people around a big table. And if you have done that, sometimes you recognize the group. It's the funny guy. It's the shy person. It's the person that wants to talk most of all. It's, uh, uh, it's like uh, uh, prototypes of personalities in reality. So uh, it's very fascinating and interesting to come behind and to, uh, to get to know those different uh, personalities. So I think that whatever you do, if you are an artist, you are an artist. You are nothing else. Uh, so uh, that yeah, my that's question. my answer. <laughs> uh, uh, I also think that as a person, sometimes you have a high tempo. You, you do things very fast. But sometimes you have to lower your tempo. And when you think that I don't have anything to say, I'm empty, it's finished, that's a very important period to be careful about. Because I think that when you, you think your uh, mind uh, tells you that you are finished as a uh, creating person, then something is happening in your back mind that you don't have any control over. So I think that you shall use everything in your, in, in your mind. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. I recently I saw a movie, Why We Are Creative. And a movie about uh, why people, a lot of famous people, why we are creative. And I want to ask you a question, why you are creative? Why? It's happened with you. Why are you artist? Uh, I, I, do, I don't know if I ever have asked myself that. Uh, 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 to, as a start, I was uh, thrown out from a lot of schools. Uh, this is a person who never graduated from any education. Seriously, you were relegated. Yeah. You were thrown, literally yeah. thrown out of school. So I didn't just... have so many choices from the start, <laughs> I can tell you. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think that I do things in a way uh, to understand. I sit for myself uh, and try to go through things uh, in another way to understand. Uh, I think that if I hadn't been working with what I have as an artist, I, have, I had gone mad or got criminal. <laughs> <laughs> Those two choices. Thanks. Can I add a comment here? You, you have also said that um, to some degree you were expecting 
expected to become an artist from from uh, your father. Yeah, that that's true. Uh, uh, so there was that readiness. was too complicated to, to to bring into this. But my father uh, wanted to be an artist when he was young, and he uh, uh, then uh, started to do. Uh, uh, what that? Film, uh, Post, film posters. Uh, film posters for American movies. And uh, then he s continued to uh, start uh, film companies with friends and to buy uh, films from Italy and France. And uh, that was a way of surviving in the tw uh, 20s and in the 30s. Uh, and, uh, uh, and he uh, uh, left uh, being an artist because he had to survive. And, uh, and he had a dream of being, he was educated, went to an art school when he was a teenager and uh, went to Paris, Paris to, to, to a painting school. So he had this very strong dream. And so I am his uh, eldest daughter and, uh, and he wanted me to do what he never did. So I am raised to be an artist so my uh, when i had my fights with my father when i was 14 15 16 17 the worst thing i could uh, yell to him was i don't want to be an artist i want to earn money as a secretary and buy lipsticks and clothes <laughs> and then he got mad uh, uh, and uh, uh, but later on that was what i uh, ended up in anyhow Uh, hi, thank you both for the amazing interview. Um, I have two brief questions to you, Marie Louise. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you are a self-made artist. You don't look up to someone, but I suppose there were quite many great artists in the 60s and 70s. Did you get inspired by someone? Yes, of course. This older friend, Eivind Falström, uh, was uh, uh, at that time a very famous uh, artist in Sweden, and he had also a career in in uh, in New York, and he, he was a fantastic. He is a fantastic uh, artist, and he brought. And I, I mean, I uh, looked upon uh, at Klaus Oldenburg, of course, at Rauschenberg, at those American artists that came to us then in the mid sixties in Stockholm. We saw them, and it was pop art, and it was. Fantastic, and and also uh, I think the uh, uh, I uh, like the comic books, Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse, uh, uh, this Lisa. I had the Phantom, uh, uh, so I th uh, I looked very much at those comic books, and I was very afraid of of uh, 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 looking at other artists as I felt that I was a lot beyond them, the level I was, the lowest level. So then uh, later on, I, ha I have had uh, periods when I have painted the uh, crying, fighting, weeping uh, women f uh, that Picasso painted in his, uh, during the 30s. Uh, so I have made a lot of uh, uh, choosing. Ha I have had them as a background uh, as uh, my room and put my own personalities and uh, 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 and tables and situations in front of those uh, weeping, fighting women of Picasso. So, and I've gone through, uh, uh, I've been painting uh, Mondrian, I've been painting uh, the Chirico, I've been painting, uh, uh, now I saw, last week I saw a picture by Kandinsky, I thought, oh, wow, perhaps <laughs> uh, I will do something out of that. So I feel like I'm just taking what I want. I didn't include that in the in the PowerPoint, but there is a big series from the mid-70s till early 80s, I think, where, as you describe it, you appropriate um, parts or whole uh, works by these artists, Picasso, um, De Chirico, um, Mondrian, Mondrian exactly. Ulle Battling. Uh, uh, yeah. So 
in a way you are absorbing Salvador the, Dali I made his the, the Wilhelm Tell with the Lenin hat you know uh, uh, and yeah yeah so you're you're appropriating them making them yours but they're also then creating a space in your paintings yeah they are my rooms so yeah. to speak instead of uh, painting a landscape with three and uh, trees and grass I have a landscape with Picasso or with the Kiriko instead. Yeah, all these pictures were included in the book, so we had a chance to see them. As so we're listening here, yeah, and the second brick question, um, why do you deal with such provocative issues, I would say, um, while you deal with sexuality and like basic instincts? Is it a kind of humor or um, self-ironical approach? What is it? Uh. I think that you shall be uh, uh, touched. That's uh, the way I work. I, I have to be touched myself. And if I get touched, I, I'm uh, one of thousands or millions of people of personalities in reality. So I think if I get touched, somebody else will get touched also. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, uh, different parts of life, uh, sex, sexuality, eating, going to the toilet, uh, uh, pissing, uh, uh, making love, uh, crying, laughing. Uh, uh, life uh, consists of different things, and, and uh, if it uh, belongs to the story I want to tell, then I will have it into my story. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I, I don't think that I do anything just describing a sexual act, technically. I'm not interested in that. I, I do it as an example of uh, something happening before or after or leading to something or the background of something. It, it belongs to the story. Or something that somebody's thinking of. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. But humor is important. Yeah. I see. <laughs> <laughs> it's great that you have so many good questions, and there are two more here. Here. Hi, thank you so much. I enjoyed your art so much. It made me so happy also to see the catalog. I would like to see a show maybe in garage also, if it's possible, you know, if it's coming. And I have a, a question about the dog, because you had this white dog in the paintings. And then there's a moment when the dog was fucking in this woman, no, blonde, and then the dog died, and then everybody died, and there's a gaze <laughs> the, with the needles and some kind of disease. And I thought it was AIDS, of course. And yeah, I just enjoyed this. And I thought maybe you can explain to me what is this dog? Is it a real dog? And I also found it very interesting that you included the animal like in this whole like world picture and discovery of yours. I don't know. Yeah. So I have a question about the dog, the white dog. Uh, I uh, uh, I didn't think of it until some years ago. Then I got the thought: we had a white dog when I was a child. <laughs> uh, I didn't think of it before. Uh, but the do dog is always white, never brown, mm -hmm. never gray, never black in my uh, uh, paintings. Always white. I think. Uh, uh, that in my back mind, uh, 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 the picture of a dog then is a white dog because that's what I had as a child, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps. Uh, but uh, if you are thinking about a certain painting with a, a dog fucking uh, the, the girl and she becomes pregnant, yeah, uh, uh, it's life and death. Yes, I, I, life and death. I think I made it... 74, it was when Elsa's mother was three years old mm -hmm. and uh, a year before my second child was born, I was happily married and I don't know why, why I thought <laughs> of those things then. I can't, I can't explain it, it for you, but uh, uh, it was a story that just opened up. Uh, I mean, that's the funny thing of uh, uh, being an artist that you 
don't have to uh, uh, pronounce things r right or wrong for yourself. You have to follow some something uh, and and just trust it, uh, and then you have done it. And uh, and if you feel all the time that it's right, you don't lie to your inner self or whatever, how to explain it. You know all the time it's you're on the right way. Well, left foot, right foot, left foot, right. You know, you don't lie. Uh, uh, then you know afterwards it's, it's good, but uh, then you can afterwards uh, say it's about this and that, but it's afterwards, so I can't describe it. And now it's many years later, so I barely don't remember the painting. Uh, the, I, I, uh, I was in a situation some days ago, yeah, some days ago, where we talked about this in Stockholm, about <coughs> this painting. <coughs> I started describing it totally wrong. <laughs> and uh, uh, my first husband, we are very good friends today, uh, he sat beside me and he he talked he, he continued talking about it and then i understood he's telling another story than i did so i had to say i'm sorry to the audience and say i don't remember the story at all uh, uh, <coughs> so uh, yeah you don't have to have an answer you do the painting Uh, hi, hello, thank you both uh, for this evening, it was awesome. Uh, I love um, <coughs> your, um, I really like your sense of humor, it's awesome. And I have a question about uh, feminism in contemporary art, uh, because right now a lot of uh, women artists uh, have a feminist in uh, first place and uh, their CV, I'm feminist. Uh, and um, sometimes it looks like just position, uh, because uh, the person think um, if I'm not feminist, I'm not modern uh, women artist. Sometimes it look like really a neurotic person uh, or kill all men and something like that. And um, uh, I mean, where is the line between all the things? Uh, where is pure feminism <laughs> in art? Uh, not uh, not a simple position uh, without inner sense. Uh, where is... Uh, um, that in uh, art a lot. <laughs> uh, well, um, I think for some people it's a position that you that you take without uh, reflecting so much, and uh, in many other cases it's it's people who have a, a world view and a way of acting where feminism is, is completely integrated. It's part of, of uh, the DNA somehow. Um, to label oneself as a feminist or not is maybe not the essential thing. It's actually what is happening in the, in the agency, in the doing of things. I remember, Marie-Louise, um, in an interview a few years ago, uh, you were asked if you would call yourself a feminist, and you said that you always felt reluctant to accept labels and the only label that you could really take on was the one of an artist because an artist uh, takes responsibility, full responsibility of uh, his or her work or should do so. Um, and at the same time, if I think about the work that you did uh, as uh, a dean at the Royal Institute of Art, the Academy, or even at the, the Royal Dramatic Theater, you implemented feminism very, very strictly in terms of thinking about the working conditions, the situations at the school, at the theater, etc. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, the important thing is uh, if you are in charge of anything, uh, I don't talk about uh, as a painter now, but if you are in charge at the theater, for instance, your decisions are extremely important. If you talk about uh, uh, having 
place on stage, as an example, it's very important how you do the sceneries. Uh, heter det scenerier? Sceneries? Uh, the stage the, design? The sta nej, alltså scenerierna. Uh, uh, the acting on stage. Uh, 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 if you tell the traditional way, if you have two male actors, two female actors, you have the male actors sitting and the females are uh, turning around, walking around. If you shall take a picture, the male actor sits down, the, the female stands like this. <laughs> uh, uh, it's also a language where you de describe a situation, a hierarchy between man and woman. If you do, uh, 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 if when you direct on stage and and I can talk without this. <laughs> and if you and if you, I think they're recording, so it's probably a good uh -huh. idea. Okay, uh, uh, and if you uh, and if you uh, aren't aware of how the male actors move and how the female male actors move, that's also an. Uh, uh, a language, then it's dangerous. Uh, certain things happen when people do things, whatever they do, and you and when you analyze things and dis make decision about situations. If you shall do things on stage and on films, and if you paint, uh, you have to uh, to be aware of uh, how how the communication is. And I think that uh, uh, if it's new for you, then you have to be very careful. But if uh, it has gone into your mind, then you do, can concentrate on other things. So I think see it as is some kind of child uh, sickness if you have to explain for yourself and your surrounding all the time that you are a feminist, then you are in the beginning of something. So, yeah, um, one more. Time is uh, running, uh, and I'm looking at you in terms of question. Yes. Okay, me again. <laughs> Sorry, two questions yeah. <laughs> with my neighbor. Okay, um, maybe the question is strange, but still, uh, I wonder when you uh, watch any artworks. Uh, in galleries, in museums, or maybe in the internet, how do you d understand? Is it a good artwork or bad? Maybe this question for both of you, Marie and Marie Louise. Please. If it's a good, if it's a good piece of art, yes. when I see something, or bad. Uh, yes. Uh, for me, it is if. Uh, if I see something that I didn't expect, uh, uh, that's good. Uh, but if, uh, uh, if if it's something that I feel is uh, trying to uh, make me feel something uh, that uh, the the person that has made it expects. Uh, uh, then it's uh, something that is weird, I think. Uh, uh, it has, be, has to be direct in some way. It, uh, that doesn't mean that, it don't, that it's not complicated, but it, it has to be uh, honest. It has, uh, I think that if, if you uh, look upon a po person as a genial person as a person that is uh, has a, uh, a, 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 that you are very touched by i think that's a rather easy communication i would say uh, uh, it's uh, it has to do with if you trust somebody or not and if you uh, if you look as if it's important and it's uh, looking as uh, as something 
that has been made before that also that's also important like this i think I don't think there is a formula for this, but there are certain indications, let's say. Um, and uh, my interests are sh shaped in a particular way and uh, they have particular characteristics. So for instance, I tend to be interested in work that has a, a relationship to the surrounding world, sort of uh, showing its face uh, to the surrounding world. But where this uh, relationship to the surrounding world, and that can be real conditions, um, have a very personal approach somehow, where there is something um, special in terms of how it is being dealt with. It can be uh, rather poetic, but it can also sometimes be quite straightforward and political, but it has to have this uh, aspect of, of, of being, um, special somehow. And I think it's important for, for particularly younger artists to have a certain awareness of what is going on around you so that you do not reinvent the wheel. But at the same time, uh, it can be, as you have done, Marie-Louise, really good not to look too much at other works. But you're lucky you because... Get, you can get jealous if it's very good things <laughs> around, you know? <laughs> but, but also in the sense that you, um, in your case, you, you have not been super interested in, in the art world. You have been more interested in people, let's say. So you have made your... Um, you, have create, you have created your language very much out of yourself. It's not dialectical so much in relation to what is going on in the rest of the art world. But I think you're in a way a lucky coincidence because most uh, artists that I come across with this approach, they end up reinventing the wheel. And that rarely becomes good work, let's say. But that that work can mean a lot in a particular context. That's not, it doesn't mean that it doesn't uh, have an importance for people who experience it um, at a certain point in time in a specific place. Um, uh, I want to give an example of an artist where for me it is really fantastic to see somebody dealing with something that feels urgent and current today, but in a extremely um, unusual personal manner. Her name is Ingela Irman, and uh, she will be shown in the Nordic Pavilion in Venice, at the Biennial in Venice this spring. And she's really interested in ethnobiology, so the relationship between humans and nature, plants, animals, etc. And her artworks are often large-scale sculptures slash costumes that she's wearing herself for performances. So they're made out of papier-mâché, fabric, uh, sticks, uh, tarpaulins, uh, uh, toothpicks, very cheap materials. And then she often seeks out the contexts where this work is happening. So the White Cube institutional space is fine, the work exists there also, but often she decides to do a little performance dressed as a pine cone, tal, uh, gran cotte, um, in a particular place in the forest. Or she makes a fantastic sculpture of a giant water lily, an jättenäckros. And then the performance is that she's actually enacting the blossoming of this in a greenhouse in a botanical garden in a small town in Sweden. Um, very, very special and touching upon how we actually coexist on this planet. Thank you. Um, I have a question about your professor's career. Uh, have you got some statement of teaching, maybe, working with students? Uh, your question, if I have some... Uh, some statement of teaching. Any rules or maybe any things about it? Uh, I think that something, uh, I don't know if I have any statesman, uh, statements, but I, 
I remember that when I went into my studios, uh, to my student studios, and 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 the most important part that we had together was listening from my side. I think that uh, if I ask a student, uh, the most important thing wasn't the right, uh, the red beside the orange or the blue. Doesn't matter. Uh, 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 the important question was, what do you want? Uh, uh, what do you What do you want? Uh, uh, w w and the student didn't uh, couldn't answer that, of course, and tried then to talk about mm -hmm. to put the words into the air, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, to try to to. Uh, uh, pronounce uh, something in the uh, in the room, yeah. uh, and that is important when you hear uh, what uh, you say, and and you he all of a sudden the student hear uh, something, uh, uh, some words, and uh, and things are happening. It's very uh, uh, it takes time, uh, uh, but. It, it, I think it's good uh, to try to take things out of your head. Uh, if I uh, I do s uh, sketches very often before I start painting, uh, uh, just to uh, to get a hint of the idea, not fully to externalize. Yeah, because. To dare to do this, because all of a sudden you say, oh my God, this isn't good, or wrong, wrong. Uh, uh, uh. So it's, uh, and it's something that have uh, has to do with uh, to, uh, trust. And uh, are there any ways to formalize your thoughts? What, are there? Any ways to formalize your thoughts? Uh, Maybe not more than I have tried to. Maybe uh, uh, some uh, structures of it, or any models, or anything about this. May I answer this, Marie? -Louise? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I think the way that you formalize your thoughts are exactly what we've seen here. It is the paintings, it is the films, it is the theater plays, um, and also the texts. Uh, from the little poetic snippets in the newspaper to the more debating articles about a certain issue or situation, let's say. So, And this is one of the really, really special things about you, is that you move across such a variety of expressions, um, but with a consistency at the same time. And somebody has described your trajectory professionally as unique for a woman of your generation in terms of achievements, artistically speaking, and uh, leadership, having directed the Royal Institute of Art, the Academy in Stockholm, as well as the Royal Dramatic Theatre, in addition to the achievements um, as a visual artist, as a filmmaker, as a playwright, etc. And I think that's actually true. Maybe we should conclude here. Yes, because we have uh, 30 minutes until the closing of the museum. And Otherwise I would really we, I mean, love to show Marie Louise the show that she is a part of. Of course. Because <laughs> <laughs> she hasn't seen it. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much, Marie Louise and Marie. This was amazing, and we could sit here all night, really, listening and talking and asking more questions. But uh, let's give a round of applause to our wonderful guests.